This, of course, our mission patch, and uh, we like it a lot. We think it told a story all of its own, very appropriate for the uh, flight. This is the morning of launch, uh, going through all of our suit-up drill, and uh, each one of us then goes through a uh, pressure check, a suit integrity check, and you see that in progress here for uh, all five of us sort of in turn. Suiting up has added a little time to the morning's event, so we split the crew two and then three to, so that we can all arrive at a common state of readiness and walk out together, as you see here. The trip to the launch pad's relatively quick. Um, it was dark, as you could all see. Uh, you get out there, and I think uh, you've heard it said by other crew members that you get out there and there's a little bit different on launch morning because the vehicle seems to be <coughs> alive. This is actually the main engine start, which occurs roughly six to seven seconds before the liftoff. Uh, and then the solid rocket boosters ignite. On board this time, I think I was a little bit more sensitized to everything. Uh, I actually felt the main engine ignition inside and you could feel the twang of the vehicle and everybody feels the solid rocket boosters ignite because you get lots more noise and vibration and with the suits, which none of us had worn before, you actually end up bouncing around inside this little environment of your own. Um, our ascent was pretty much a, a, a normal, what we call direct insertion where uh, we actually did not do a, an ohms or an orbital maneuvering system one burn. We just allowed ourselves to glide on up uh, to basically a 331 by 27 or 47 nautical mile orbit before we did our insertion burn. Uh, the main engine cutoff velocity was a little bit faster than we normally see, roughly 26,000 feet per second. And uh, the most impressive thing to me was the way we could not see the Earth after Miko. As you all know, our altitude was unique for the shuttle program. We went to 330 miles circular orbit. It was, it was truly noticeable and impressive from on board, and we hope that we were able to share some of that with you on the downlink television. First thing every crew does is get the orbiter configured for being on orbit, and of, I think particular concern to our crew was the number of activities that we had to accomplish on flight day one, including checking out the RMS, which you see us doing here. We do that early in the flight, of course, because if there were failures with the arm, we would have overnight and the next morning to try to figure out what the impact would be on the Hubble Space Telescope deploy operations. In our case, the arm worked beautifully and there were no problems at all with RMS checkout and, and we got that done on time on flight day one. And uh, the other major activity that was going on at that time was uh, doing all the preparatory work for the potential spacewalk the next day. Yeah, what you're seeing here is uh, the Power Ratchet tool, which is a device uh, produced by the Goddard Space Flight Center, uh, adapted specifically to uh, work on the Space Telescope, both the maintenance and repair missions, and uh, for deploying the solar arrays, which, if done manually, required 120 full turns, and in suited tests underwater, it proven to be fairly fatiguing. Uh, this unit has its own internal battery, uh, a high-performance electric motor and a little microprocessor controller to control the speed, the torque, uh, and the number of turns per trigger setting or per trigger squeeze. Here you see some uh, additional configuration of tools uh, going into the airlock in preparation uh, for the EVA that almost was. In addition to configuring the airlock with a, about a dozen tools, most of which were unique to the HST possible deploy mission tasks, uh, we had to conduct a, a pre-breathe, reduce the cabin pressure, and check out all three of the spacesuits we had. We had a, an upper torso assembly, which includes all the life support systems and computer monitoring systems on the suit as a spare unit in the event that either of the primary suits for Bruce or I had developed a problem. Uh, all in all, it took uh, Bruce and I the lion's share of our time on flight day one and a goodly measure of Charlie's time. Charlie was always the critical resource being split between <coughs> the RMS operations and the EVA. Early in the morning on flight day two, which was actually less than 24 hours after launch, we were given a go for HST deploy operations, and that meant that I was uh, uh, go to uncradle the RMS and move it over and grapple the space telescope in the bay, which you see here. We're trying to convey uh, a sense, I think, of uh, how big the space telescope is, and uh, the fact that the aperture door is bright and shiny and it's, it's right in front of the windows. And uh, all of that, as I had described in the pre-flight 
press conference was of some concern to me, being able to see, to do the task. Uh, it was about as difficult as, as we had expected, and, and the views, as you can see here, uh, out the window certainly degrade rapidly as the telescope begins to come out of the bay. Uh, Charlie was very helpful at uh, talking me through the deploy operations with the arm, particularly, as I mentioned, down low in the bay where the clearances are fairly small and you're trying to go, go slowly. Uh, if you look carefully through the window, I think you'll be able to see the rate at which we were trying to move the, the HST up out of the bay. Uh, slow is, is good when you have two very large vehicles very close together. And uh, as you know, it took a little bit longer on orbit to do that task than uh, we had simulated on the ground, and I think that, that that's probably to be expected uh, given the, uh, the fact that uh, we weren't really the pacing item in the deploy sequence anyway, <coughs> and uh, we wanted to make sure that the, the job was done properly. There are a number of coordinated activities that actually need to take place. It isn't just Charlie and, and me operating the arm, but Lauren has to position the, the vehicle, the orbiter vehicle, in the proper attitude so that the sun shines on the proper part of the space telescope. And, and he had to make a couple of different maneuvers in addition to manually holding the, the orbiter's attitude uh, near where it wanted to be while the, the arm and the telescope were in motion. We had a number of constraints governing how the, the orbiter could move uh, when the telescope was unberthed and when it was in motion, and, and he had to manage all of that very carefully. We did find that this manual control of the uh, orbiter using uh, certain DAP settings or digital autopilot work very well and uh, have recommended that uh, that be uh, highly <coughs> considered as a mode of uh, orbiter control in large payloads like this. After Steve lifted the telescope clear of the bay, he went through a, a number of maneuvers the end result of which was getting the, the bottom or the base end of the telescope pointing forward. Uh, and after Lauren oriented the orbiter, these, this was pointing toward the sun. The solar array booms were folded out 90 degrees. And as you see here, the solar array panels were unrolled. You have to watch very closely because this is a, a rather slow process, taking on the order of uh, six minutes to fully unreal these uh, sets of solar array panels. Uh, there are five separate solar panel assemblies on each side of the, the center drum, uh, two arrays on the entire telescope. The uh, set that you see here, the plus V2 solar array, deployed very nicely. Uh, as I'm sure you're aware, later on, uh, there were some difficulties deploying the minus V2 array, which led uh, Kathy and myself to finish the suiting up process uh, and ultimately to get into the airlock, uh, depressurize the airlock to five pounds per square inch or approximately half the cabin pressure and to stand by just inches away from the hatch and from the depress valve for about two hours until uh, telescope separation and release from the orbiter was complete and until Steve had completed berthing the RMS. Here you see the plus V2 array fully deployed. These arrays are a contribution from the European Space Agency along with the faint object camera and represent 15 to 20 percent of their participation in the program. When uh, the solar ray that had been giving us trouble was finally unfurled properly, we actually didn't have very much time until the release opportunity. As I recall, it was around 30 minutes or so. So there were a number of activities that, that Lauren and I had to do uh, with Charlie's help, and Charlie was kind of going back and forth between the flight deck and the mid deck throughout the day. Uh, we noticed that uh, one of the surprises was the amount of clearance between the arm and the uh, solar array at separation. It was a little bit less than we had been led to expect from the simulations that we had performed on the ground. However, the control of the arm was very precise, and the control of the orbiter at separation was very precise, and uh, we had no concerns about about contacting the arm with the solar ray, uh, but it was something that Lauren and I kept a, a very close eye on. What you're seeing in this scene is actually the space telescope after release as we are flying over the western coast of Peru, uh, actually crossing the Andes Mountains, and that, that to me was pretty spectacular from a visual sense. Some of the information that we learned on this flight <coughs> that we hope to pass on to whichever crew is selected to do maintenance and repair missions on the HST. It's the fact that the HST is highly visible. I guess you would expect that just because uh, 
of the way it's, it's configured with reflecting uh, thermal blankets and the big solar rays uh, also providing a lot of reflecting surface area. We could see it for a long time, of course, post-release. In addition, we found throughout the flight, every terminator, we would be able to see the HST reflecting sunlight even at a distance of, of greater than 40 miles. Uh, that was a little bit of a surprise. Uh, of course, as Bruce and Kathy can describe, this is uh, not the end of anything but the beginning of the lifetime of the telescope and, and a lot of the work that they did on this flight will, will come back to produce results years from now as the maintenance uh, missions are, are launched to service the telescope and keep it an operational observatory for years to come. Yeah. As Steve has mentioned, it is designed for a, a 15 to 20 year lifetime as an observatory facility with uh, planned visits roughly every five years to replace those components which are known to degrade, such as the batteries and the solar arrays, uh, to replace anything that fails, and also to provide the opportunity for exchanging scientific instruments as the data which comes back from the current set of five instruments uh, is analyzed and perhaps reveals new pathways to explore. Uh, I talked with the folks in the uh, Space Telescope Operations Control Center this morning uh, they have rearranged some elements of the checkout, bringing the scientific instrument checkout forward and working on some minor problems in the pointing and control system. But all in all, they feel like uh, they're about on schedule in terms of the amount of checkout uh, that's required. Uh, here you see me looking at the uh, protein crystal growth experiment. Uh, this is a secondary payload from the University of Alabama in Birmingham. And in this close-up shot, uh, chamber C3, you can see some crystals of uh, carboxyl ester hydrolase, which is one of the, the compounds. The idea here is to create large defect-free crystals in zero gravity that can be used under X-ray analysis to reveal the exact structure of the protein. And once the structure has been revealed, uh, you can tailor antibodies or vaccines or other biological agents and then produce those uh, to yield the desired effect. Unlike zero-G electrophoresis where we were attempting to manufacture commercial quantities of substances, this is just designed to discover the structure and do the rest of the work on the ground. This is one of the other secondary experiments we had. It was. Uh, conceived of by a student at a high school at the time in Utah and sponsored by a corporation out there. What you see are three different views. Uh, the center one is the, the actual electrical arc being struck and the two others are mirror views. And the idea was to look at what effects uh, driving an arc and affecting it with outside magnetic fields would have in zero G. We carried two IMAX cameras. One was the in-cabin camera that you see uh, Kathy and me trying to get reloaded here. Uh, the other was the IMAX uh, cargo bay camera, which we have not seen any of the film yet, but uh, hopefully we'll see in another week or two. This Here's is one of our... of Kathy's dad's fishing camp. <laughs> yeah, that's about right. Uh, I was obligated to make sure I got a few good shots of some key places in Baja, California for my father, but uh, we also tried to put some of the spectacular earth views that we had on film to give you a sense of both the scale of the view and the rate of passage, which is a little slower of course, at this altitude than, than lower flights. Uh, in some of the stills, which we'll get to later, you may get a, a better appreciation of this. Here you're over uh, central Mexico. The two bright dots at the upper center portion of the frame are the two large volcanoes just southeast of Mexico City. And if you strain a little bit just up and to the left of those volcanoes, you may see a slightly lighter, grayer patch of ground. And that is, in fact, the urban area of Mexico City itself. Uh, it was easy to have all of Mexico, literally from the California-Mexico border to the Gulf Coast and on up to Houston in your field of view at one time from our altitude, which was very spectacular. In fact, as uh, <clears throat> mentioned, perhaps during the flight, uh, on one pass roughly in this location going to the east, we were puzzled to see a, a lake where it, we didn't recognize any lake should be. And on thinking about it, Lauren realized that it was Lake Michigan that we were seeing. And in fact, we later saw Lake Erie and Lake Ontario being able to see entirely across the north-south width of the United States from over the Gulf of Mexico. And here you're seeing across almost all of South America from just slightly east of the crest of the Andes 
out to the coast by Rio de Janeiro. This was one of the least popular experiments <laughs> aboard. I wondered whether anyone would still speak to me after this if I hadn't already been hit. <laughs> this is something like eight TB tests at once. There's a, a uh, certain toxin on each one of those sets of tines, and the idea is to determine whether the body's response to uh, immune system response varies at all in zero G. Uh, some of the body's immune response, of course, is governed by the, the blood system, and another level of it is controlled uh, by the cellular structure of the body. And the objective of this experiment specifically was to look at cell-mediated immune response and see if one mission specialist could survive <laughs> administering it to two other people. On the day before entry, we go through <coughs> a series of tests that we call flight control system or FCS checkout. Uh, what Lauren, Steve, and I were doing here was actually going through various tests of uh, the hydraulic system with the auxiliary power unit running, actually firing the uh, RCS jets to make sure that they all operated properly and uh, make sure that all the, the systems on board were going to be good or go for the entry day. Our, our FCS checkout went very, very smoothly with uh, only uh, very insignificant anomalies which we had seen before on previous flights. This is, uh, we were trying to get you some lightning, and you can see it over in the left, the, oh, by, to the left of the Earth's limb there. That's one of the more spectacular scenes of nighttime, is the lightning all over the Earth. Um, just unbelievable when you, when you get a chance to see it. This is uh, later in entry then. This is about Mach 6, taken from a tracking camera out at Vandenberg. Uh, we had been doing several uh, aero PTIs on the way in, all the way through entry, to gather aerodynamic data to uh, try to expand the uh, flight envelope of the shuttle slightly. This is a, uh, a scene here of uh, we're rolling on the hack and coming around uh, heading alignment circle. Uh, you can see the uh, sun on the very bottom of the wing there. That, that sun angle presented somewhat of a problem to uh, Charlie and I uh, as we flew right into it uh, trying to turn on to the alignment circle. And it wasn't until we got more than halfway around the uh, circle that we finally had the sun out of our eyes. Hard to read uh, inside and then transition to outside. I was fortunate that Lauren is a real gracious soul, and uh, the pilot is kind of a misnomer. Uh, you're a co-pilot, but Lauren gave me an opportunity to fly the vehicle a little bit as we went subsonic, and uh, I thought it performed amazingly well. Uh, We've just come through the inner glide slope there, and uh, ha once you start to pull the nose up, of course, you're losing all the... Uh, precious airspeed that you had preserved at that point. Charlie lowered the gear about 300 feet above the ground, and we just uh, came on in, uh, establish an attitude and kind of hold it for the landing. We had uh, been sort of on again, off again for uh, landing that day for the wind situation out at Edwards, as you probably recall. And uh, we uh, seemed to run out of uh, airspeed a little bit uh, quicker than normal that I'm used to in the STA. But uh, the shuttle uh, does have a, a lot of reserve capability there. So overall, the landing went uh, very smoothly, and the nose wheel uh, derotation rate uh, continued to be very slow uh, for the entire derotation. We uh, also flew uh, the new carbon brakes for the shuttle program for the first time. Uh, those brakes turned out to work very well. They're very smooth and very positive, I think, uh, uh, they'll be a great asset to the program as we continue to uh, fly those on other vehicles now and then look toward uh, returning to uh, KSC for landing. And of course, I planned that stop exactly in front of the tower with this camera in mind so we could get a new slant on things. And uh, we did, uh, oh, 30 or 40 minutes worth of uh, post landing uh, cleanup switches and uh, reconfiguring, and then we're ready to get out of the inside. Fairly cool outside that day. It was about 44 or 45 degrees uh, wind chill factor, so we stayed inside the suits. Uh. We had sent along the regular blue flight suits that we thought we were going to get into, but as Lauren mentioned, the wind chill factor made it desirous to just, and the combination of your heat inside the suit and the coolness of the desert air out there made it perfect. split the crew two and then three to, so that we can all arrive at a common state of readiness and walk out together as you see here. The trip to the launch pad's relatively quick. Um, it was dark, as you could all see. Uh, you get out there, and I think uh, you've heard it 
said by other crew members that you get out there and there's a little bit different on launch morning because the vehicle seems to be alive. This is actually the main engine start, which occurs roughly six to seven seconds before the liftoff. Uh, and then the solid rocket boosters ignite. On board this time, I think I was a little bit more sensitized to everything. Uh, I actually felt the main engine ignition. This, of course, our mission patch, and uh, we like it a lot. We think it told a story all of its own, very appropriate for the uh, flight. This is the morning of launch, uh, going through all of our suit-up drill, and uh, each one of us then goes through a uh, pressure check, a suit integrity check, and you see that in progress here for uh, all five of us sort of in turn. Suiting up has added a little time to the morning's events, so we split orbit before we did our insertion burn. Uh, the main engine cutoff velocity was a little bit faster than we normally see, roughly 26,000 feet per second. And uh, the most impressive thing to me was the way we could not see the Earth after Miko. As you all know, our altitude was unique for the shuttle program. We went to 330 miles circular orbit, it was, it was truly noticeable and impressive from on board, and we hope that we were able to share some of that with you on the downlink television. First thing every crew does is get the orbiter configured for being on orbit, and if, I think particular concern to our crew was the number of activities that we had to accomplish on flight day one, including checking out the RMS, which you see us doing here. We do that early in the flight, of course, because if there were failures with the arm, we would have overnight and the next morning to try to figure out what the impact would be on the Hubble Space Telescope deploy operations. In our case, the arm worked beautifully and there were no problems at all with RMS checkout and, and we got that done on time on flight day one. And uh, the other major activity that was going on inside and you could feel the twang of the vehicle and everybody feels the solid rocket boosters ignite because you get lots more noise and vibration, and with the suits, which none of us had worn before, you actually end up bouncing around inside this little environment of your own. Um, our ascent was pretty much a, a, a normal, what we call direct insertion, where uh, we actually did not do a, an ohms or an orbital maneuvering system one burn. We just allowed ourselves to glide on up uh, to basically a 331 by 27 or 47 nautical miles.